my voice sounds a little scratchy or something is because we just got out of a three day, I said a three day conference. I know it was two days, but we minister three times, two times on Saturday. So I want to greet you this morning. And But before we do that, I want to give honor to the set man and the set woman of this house. I thank God that your pastor allowed us to come speak to you. And so I honor your pastor this morning, Pastor Mike and Josie this morning. Thank you. You know, I, when I first met Pastor Mike, he came to Kansas City, and he was with uh, Ron Simpkin. And all of us in Kansas City call Pastor Ron Uncle Ron Ron. And if you know Pastor Ron Ron, he likes to go eat, right? So when he comes to Kansas City, we used to pastor a church, and he used to come to our church and minister for us a lot. And he's friends with our pastor. So we will go out to eat, and he likes to go eat Southern food. So we would take him to go eat Southern food, and he would eat, and Uncle Ron Ron would say, Jose and Angela, take me to this restaurant. And he would go there and eat food, and, and we would just have a good time. But when he brought your pastor to Kansas City, your pastor delivered such a word to our family. Like, he, I never met him. The word was so accurate. Even my children, I mean, still today, my daughter that came with us, they go, where are you going? You're talking about the guy that said this, this, this. And I'm like, yeah, that's him. They were so terrified because the word was so accurate. So I want to tell you, you guys are blessed. Don't take it for granted because everybody don't have what you have. And so when we went to your conference, I was so blessed. He was giving us books. Me and Gina got a book. And if you know me or if you don't know me, I love prayer. And so he gave us different books. And I was going to fly out the next day to preach a revival in California. And the book that he gave me was on prayer. Let me tell you, we do prayer and devotion on our ministry page Monday through Friday. And I go, wow, this is crazy. So I get on the plane and God said, just take that same book with you. Do you know I read the whole book till I got to my destination, the whole book front to back, and I read it two times. So I want to tell you, God knows how to do things prophetic for you to enhance you for the kingdom of God. I love this scripture that says in Psalms 122, when, they, when I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. This is the day and the hour that God is going to cause his people to come to the house of the Lord. The church will win. The church will remain when Christ come. Everything else will fade away, but the Christ does the church and the Holy Spirit will remain on the earth and we are the church saints we are the church and we are the one that are bringing them to Christ and so I believe that word what your pastor said this morning we better get ready we need to prepare I've been saying that for this last season I said there's something coming to the earth there's something tangible coming to the earth God uses us. He only moves, the Holy Spirit moves through you. We can't see it, listen to me, with the natural eye. It's going to take a supernatural move of God's Spirit on the earth. The Bible said that it's the Spirit of God that draw men. Unless you have the Holy Spirit, they're not going to come when you speak. And so I believe God is preparing a people to get ready more than ever in this time. We're not going to have time to go, go do all the things what we want to do. We better run to the house of God. We better press through. We better pray. We better cultivate prayer in our life so that we can hear what the heavenlies are saying to us. Because God, listen, he's getting us ready. I tell my children all the time, I say, listen, if you call me and I'm gone, believe me, I'm going to reach heaven. I didn't do this all this time to waste my time. I want to see what heaven has because guess what? On this earth, it has to be better than this. It has to be better than this. And so this morning, I want you to just sit down, buckle down. I know you're sitting down, but you know how you sit down, but you're not sitting down? Your mind's still going 100. So this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit rests upon you. 
that you can hear what God has to say. I know this is going to be an amazing service. I will come back up and minister with my husband, but I know God has given him a word for this church this morning. And thank you again for having us. Amen. Well, glory. Come on, put your hands together. Give Jesus a praise. Come on. Come on. He's worthy this morning. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Man, it is an honor to be here with you on this morning. Um, does anybody like Christmas as much as I do? Come on. Anybody like Christmas as much as I what are, You know, of, of course, the birth of Christ, you know, it's, it's always number one. But, but, but I love getting presents. Love getting gifts. Hey, Amen. Come on. You go down, you know, and they got gifts and they got your name on them. You're like, whoo, man, come on. Somebody was thinking about me. I, I love gifts. Uh, and the Bible says in the book of Ephesians that God has given gifts to the church. Apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints and for the edification. So when God thought about, come on, the church here, he thought very, very uh, 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 deep. And he said, man, I have to give them the very best. Uh, so God gave you the very best that he had in Pastor Mike, amen, as he sent them to, uh, here to be a part and to be a leader here. So I want you to put your hands together and come on. This is Pastor Appreciation Day across America. I want you to appreciate your pastors. Come on, tell them you love them. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Show love and show honor to the set man and woman in this house. Amen. Pastor Mike, God bless you. We love you. Thank you so much for this opportunity, amen, to be a part of New Hope in Christ on this morning. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I am Puerto Rican. I mean, what does that mean? I speak very fast. Yeah, I, I speak very fast. I, 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 I love caffeine. Um, so something happens with, I don't know if it's the caffeine, if it's just me talking fast, or if it's the Holy Ghost. Uh, we made some combustion in the atmosphere. We bring heaven down to earth. So if I begin to talk real, real, real fast, uh, and I look like, man, I'm about to lose y'all, I would need you to do this. And I probably won't slow down, but at least I know I have your attention. Is that good? Hey, Amen. Come on. I, I'm going to try to minister this word uh, that God has laid upon my spirit. Uh, uh, and and uh, I just have to, uh, man, I just want to go to so many places right now. Um, and so much in my spirit. Uh, but let me just start off by telling you this, uh, that we have all made mistakes in the past. Will all the perfect people just stand? All right, good. All of us are in the same place. Come on now. I mean, we have all struggled in the past. Listen, we have all come short of our goals in the past. We all have sinned in the past. Amen. Come on. But let me just encourage you on this morning and let you know this. Do not let your past determine your future. Don't allow what people have done to you or what you have done to people determine your outcome. Do not allow the broken promises. Listen, do not allow the hurt. Do not allow the letdowns, the setbacks, the inconsistency. Listen, or even the many times that you have quit determine your future. God does not look at your past, but instead he shows you a marvelous future. He shows you, come on, that your past is not going to determine where you're headed. If I could for the next few moments, uh, and man, um, I, th I think I said, I think he told me I had to like three o'clock. So I want to make sure I want to uh, get you out of here um, uh, before. Uh, what time does Denver play today? At what time? 225. Oh, she's like 225. We got to get out of here before 225. <laughs> Come on. Hey, Amen. The enemy of my enemy is my best friend today. So all you Denver Bronco fans in here, I'm behind you today. You guys need to beat the Raiders. Hey, Amen. <laughs> I come from Kansas City, so I need the Raiders to lose. Come on. <laughs> boo. Dang, you guys boo the preacher? My goodness, man. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says this. For I know the thoughts that I have or that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Amen. if I could for the next few moments, I just want to minister on a topic entitled simply this, your ladder is greater. 
Come on, your ladder or your later, however it is, New King James, Old King James. Come on, your later, your ladder is greater than where you are at. I love the way that Paul put it in the book of Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6. Being confident of this very thing, uh, that he who has begun a good work. Uh, somebody say good work. Uh, come on, come on, say it like you really mean it. Say good work. Uh, and you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, let me remind you of one thing real quick, uh, that he is not done with you yet. Uh, the finished work of the cross is enough uh, for your failures. Uh, the finished work of the cross uh, is enough for your lack. Uh, the finished work of the cross uh, is enough for your disappointments, your letdowns. Listen, and yes, even your sins. Uh, God is enough, uh, and he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Where can you hide from the presence of God? Listen, you ain't that far gone that God can't find you. You ain't that far messed up that God can't heal you. You ain't that sick. Come on, you ain't that messed up that God can't restore, redeem, and get you on the right track. Once again, I know you've gone through some stuff. I know that your past looks bad. I know that often you look uh, what you used to be. Come on, they always say you're going to be just like your mama. You're going to be just like your daddy. They always bring up uh, your past, but I'm here to declare a decree that your future is a lot better than where you were at. Thank Thank God, listen, that you're not still there, but that you are in a place now where God says, I'm getting ready to make a way out of no way. Love this. Where can you hide from God? Amen. Psalms 139, verses 7 through 11. This is in the Passion Translations. It says this. Where could I go from your spirit? Where could I run and hide from your face? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I go down to the realm of the dead, you're there too. If I fly with wings into the shining dawn, you're there. And if I fly into the radiant sunset, you're there waiting. Where I go, your hand will guide me. Your strength will empower me. It's impossible to disappear from you or to ask the darkness to hide me for your presence is everywhere bringing the light into my night. You may be in a night situation right now. You may have a midnight experience right now. You may be thinking, listen, I'll never be here. I mean, something good. I'll never be able to do nothing because of my past. I'll never be able to accomplish what God has called me to do because my past continues to hold on to me. I'm here to let you know who I come all the way from Kansas city to encourage somebody on today that your future is a lot better than your past. I'm not going to allow what I went through. I'm not going to allow the setbacks. I'm not going to allow my pain of my yesteryears. Declare amen, on what is going to happen in my future because God says I got a good future for you. I redeemed you. I restored you. I saved your life. I brought you out of the cesspool of sin. I restored your marriage. He didn't do it just because he wanted to add another check mark in the kingdom no he said because I got a call of God uh, on your life uh, and if God can do something like that for me if God can pull me out uh, of where I was at uh, amen and bring me into a glorious light uh, that he is not a respecter of a person that he can do that uh, the same thing uh, for you on this morning See, the thing is this, watch this, watch this. The thing is this, uh, is this, uh, there's perspective. Uh, and, 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 and this is something that I like to call the principle of perspective. I've, I, I've, I've lived this, uh, this last season in my life. Uh, how you think will determine where you stand or what you understand. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs 23, verse number 7, For as a man thinks in his heart, uh, so is he. So how you think uh, determines how you really are. If you say you're a nobody... In your mind or in your heart, then you'll be a nobody. But when you begin to say, I am joint heirs with Christ Jesus. When you begin to say, I'm the head and not the tail. When you begin to say, I am more than an overcomer. Then that is who you become because God said, watch this, watch this. So where you stand or what you understand determines where you sit. There's only two places in the Bible that you can sit. In the book of, 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 of Matthew chapter 23, verse number 2, talks about the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. In the book of Ephesians 2, 6, says this, and raise up raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's only two places you can sit. You can either sit in the seat of Moses, which is law, or you can sit in the seat of Christ, in Christ Jesus, in heavenly places, which is the seat of grace. So where you sit, though, determines what you see or not see. 
If you sit in Moses' seat, all you see is law. And law disqualifies you from getting to what God wants for you. But if you sit in grace uh, and you begin to look through the eyes of grace, uh, you begin to look uh, that God already paid the price when he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross on the, on the cross for my sins. Watch this. Watch, I'm getting a little excited up here. Huh? Where you sit determines what you see or not see. And what you see will determine what you will have or what you won't have or what you will do or not do. So here we see that there are two seats available. Moses' seat and the seat of grace. Moses' seat speaks of law, which disqualifies you and tells you all the reasons you can't do something or that you can't possess the land. But the other seat is a seat of grace, which belongs to Christ. And it represents the ability and favor. Watch this. The seat God has called us to sit in is a seat of grace, which gives us the ability to possess our promised land. The problem is that we are so sin conscious and we want to sit in the seat of Moses and all we think about is man I messed up oh I'll never be able to get over that I'll never be able to do this I messed up again oh my am I ever going to get it right but when you get out of the seat of Moses and get in the seat of grace in Christ Jesus in heavenly places you can look through the eyes of grace and say yes I messed up but I thank God for the blood I know I short fell I know I fell back a little bit but I thank God that he sent the son to die on the cross for my sins. I'm not telling you that grace gives you power, listen to me, or an excuse to sin. Grace empowers you not to sin. Grace empowers you to be who God has called you to be. And the problem is that we've cheapened the grace and we've cheapened the, 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 the price of the, of the blood of Jesus. Watch this. Because we use grace as a cover-up. We use grace as a cover-up. I mean, we got enough grace. What we need to do is go back to the cross and begin to beg for mercy. God, have mercy over my soul. Have mercy over the decisions that I have made. Have mercy over my life. See, God wants you to sit in the seat of grace. Watch this, uh, which gives us the ability. You remember the book of Numbers, chapter number 13, gives us the story of the Israelites when they were spying out the land. Come on, and they send out the 10 spies out there to look at the land, and they came back with a report. And they said, man, oh yeah, there's lots of uh, milk and there's honey. There's big fruit. Come on, there's big old grapes. Look at these big old grapes we brought back. Oh, but did I tell you there's some giants in the land? And this is what they said. They said, there's giants in the land. And we see ourselves as grasshoppers. So they see us as grasshoppers. Watch this. Watch this. They are giants and we are like grasshoppers in our own sights. So that is how they see us. I'm here to let you know this, uh, that you got to get out of your grasshopper mentality. The grasshopper, listen, that word grasshopper in the Greek uh, means this. It is inability. Come on, when you begin to put inability inside of you, you begin to think, yeah, they are greater. Amen. But God already gave you the land to possess it. Uh, he already said, uh, come on, this is the land that I'm giving to my people. Yes, there are uh, giants in the land. Uh, listen to me. Yes, there are. Uh, sometimes you step on a little cow poop. Uh, in your midst, in your walk with God. Sometimes you get stung with some bees, but where there's cow poop, there's cows. Where there's cows, there's milk. If you get stung by a bee, come on, that means that there's honey around. So you think that you're in a bad place, but in reality, you're in the promises of God. And God has said, I know you're going through some situations. I know you're going through some letbacks. I know you have fallen, but get yourself back up and continue to walk out because what I have for you is greater than where you were at. Second Corinthians 3, 6 says this, who also made us su sufficient as ministers of the new covenant or the new testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit gives us life. God has made us able ministers of the new covenant. Watch this. Not of the letter, which is the law, but the spirit, which is grace. Grace empowers you to become and possess. Grace empowers you not to focus and ponder on your past, but grace pushes you into your next. 
I, I know, I know. Listen, I know you're like, well, you don't know my problem. You don't know my situation. You don't know where I came from. You don't know what has happened in my life. You don't know how unbalanced I've been. You don't know how my family brought me up. You don't know my economic background. You don't know that I was this and I was that. Now you're absolutely right. I don't know. But I know a Savior. And man, that died on the cross. So that way you don't have to look at your mail. You don't have to look at your mess. You don't have to look at your shortcomings. Or you got to look at the cross and say, I thank God that he sent his son to die for my sins, for my shortcomings. I may not be who I need to be. Listen, to, mm, I, I, I say this all the time. I'm a second generation preacher. My father pastored a church for years. My mama, you know, thought that uh, growing up in high school, I was a pretty good athlete. I was a two-time state champion in wrestling uh, in the state of Kansas. Uh, so, so, you know, I was athletic and, and you know, uh, my, my, my coach thought that, that I would be, you know, uh, further along in, in, in my college career, in my Marine Corps life, uh, that I would try out for the Olympics and, and do all this. And, and, you know, my mama thought that I would be this and my friends thought that, that I would be that. Uh, but listen, 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 I may not be uh, who I thought, who they thought I should be. I may not be who my coach thought that I should be. I may not think who my mama thought I should be. I may not be who my friends thought uh, that I would be. But I'm so glad that I'm not who I used to be. I thank God. Amen. I'm so glad that I'm not getting drunk, waking up with somebody that I don't know. I thank God that I'm not getting high no more, driving around intoxicated. I thank God that I'm not sleeping around with anybody that would say yes. I thank God, listen, that I'm not self-righteous any longer, that I think that I got it all together. Amen. I know that I've made mistakes. I know that I've had some shortcomings in my life. I know that I haven't been perfect. But like I said at the beginning, where well, the perfect people please stand and nobody stood. So that means that we're all in the same boat. We've all made some mistakes. We've all had some downfalls. But I thank God that my glider and that it's going to be greater than where I was at. You think you're messed up? You think you ain't got it all together? You think that what you're going through right now will disqualify you? From what God has called you. Let me give you some examples in the Bible. And man, you think you're messed up. You think you're messed up. Jacob was a cheater. Peter had a temper. Noah got drunk. Gideon was insecure. Miriam was a gossiper. Thomas was a doubter. Sarah was impatient and barren. Elijah was moody. Elisha was depressed. Paul was a hitman. Isaac was a daydreamer. Leah was unattractive. Joseph was abused. Moses had a stuttering problem. Samson had a woman problem. Rahab was a prostitute. Timothy was too young. Zacchaeus was too short. Eli was too fat. Abraham was too old. Jeremiah was insecure. David was a murderer and an adulterer. Jonah was prejudiced. Naomi was bitter. Esther was adopted. Job was bankrupt. Mary was single. Martha was a warrior. The Samaritan woman at the well had multiple husbands. Saul was psychotic. Ruth was socially, economically challenged. And Lazarus was dead. Now tell me again why you're allowing your past to determine your future. Tell me again why you're allowing your setbacks to determine what your outcome is going to be. I've settled this and listen in my spirit a long time ago that I'm not going to allow my bank statement to, 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 to determine am I going to pay my tithe or am I going to give an offering. I'm not going to allow what happened in my job determine am I going to lift my hands during worship. Am I going to sing a song. I'm not going to allow my sickness that my body may say that I have to determine am I going to worship my God because I know this and then my situation doesn't determine my breakthrough. My situation doesn't determine Determine where I'm going because I know that God has got a future for me. Listen, listen, I learned this a long time ago that there is truth and there's facts. But there's a difference between the two of them. Ooh, I'm about to play these air drums up here. Facts will change. But the truth don't change. 
It may be a fact that you don't have money in your bank account, but the truth is that my daddy owned cattle on thousands of hills, uh, that all the gold is his, uh, that all the silver is his. uh, And man, the fact may be that the doctor said uh, that you have cancer. And man, but the truth is uh, that my God is a healer, that my God, uh, and man says, by his stripes, uh, I am healed. Uh, There's a difference between fact uh, and truth. And I'd rather stand on truth every time because truth won't change. Facts may change. Situations are going to change but one thing that will never change and that is the name of Jesus uh, that he is a strong tower come on that is the name of Jesus uh, that he is a healer that he is a deliverer the name of Jesus there's no name greater in the heavens on the earth uh, or down below than the name uh, of Jesus listen the Bible says it all the demons tremble at the name of Jesus I was in the Marine Corps station on Marine Corps Base Hawaii when the Lion King came out. Remember the Lion King? Well, my baby girl, who's 27 now, she loved the Lion King. And when I went on on deployment, when I would come back, she would be at the front door waiting for me. Daddy with her hands lifted up. And, And Daddy, come on, let's go watch the Lion King. And we would sit there and watch the Lion King. I'm going somewhere. I, mean, I don't think I'm going to give you a message on the Lion King. Uh, but I, I, I would sit there and watch the Lion King with her. I mean, and I, me and her would just look at each other when the part uh, was, 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 was when, when, when the hyenas were there and Scar came and, 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 and they said, is that Mufasa? And the hyenas would begin to shake. Mufasa. Say that name again. Mufasa. I'm here to let you know. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. It may not be Mufasa. Amen. But it's the name of Jesus that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I dare you to say the name Jesus. In the midst of your hurt, say Jesus. In the midst of your setbacks, say Jesus. In the midst of your turmoil when you call on the name of Jesus. Ah, there's something about that name. Come on, there's something about the name Jesus. I mean, he's got a great plan and a future for you. You may be going through something on this morning and say, man, I don't know how I'm going to make it out. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I ever get healed of this. I don't know if my situation will ever turn around. I'm here to let you know this, that Jesus is the answer. I love it. We sang that song, call him up. Come on, call on Jesus. I grew up in a Spanish church, Pastor. My, my, my daddy pastored the church. And man, it wasn't a big church. Uh, and my mama was a worship leader. And my dad, uh, you know, this is back in the 70s. So um, uh, the Hispanic population wasn't real big in Kansas City. Uh, so my dad had one good friend, uh, and he was an American guy, uh, uh, a white guy. Uh, and this white guy would come and preach for my daddy all the time. And he taught my mama a song. And it was simply this, Jesus is on the main line. Tell him what you want. Come on, I know I'm going old school right here. He said, Jesus is on them, and I want you to imagine this with me. A bunch of first-generation Spanish folk, uh, and then straight from Mexico, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, don't hardly know no English. And they're sitting there singing a song, Jesus is on the main line. Tell them what you want. And we grew up, and every time Pastor Gibbs would come to our church, he would have my mama sing this song, Jesus is on the main line. And then sometimes she didn't know what she was saying. And then, but she began to sing this song, Jesus. Jesus is on the main line. I mean, I'm here to let you know. I mean, he'll never send you the voicemail. He will always answer the call. I mean, he won't send you say, I'll talk to you later. I mean, I'll call you back. No, no, no. His answer machine is not on because he always answers the call. He always answers when you call him up, tell him what you want. And I began to sing that song. I mean, as a little kid. And if I didn't know no song, I knew that, that Jesus was on the main line. And I remember growing up. When times got trouble, and then when times got hard, when I felt myself in some times that I didn't know what to do, I will remember my mama singing, Jesus is on the main line. Tell him what you want. And then I know that I was going through some times right there, but I knew that if I would call on Jesus, everything would be all right. Your ladder, listen to me, your ladder is greater. Let me close with this story. We're going to pray. I got to get you guys out of here before they start giving tickets out. 
And then pastor's going to go up here and start paying for tickets and stuff. I, I, I sat right there. I was like, I got a ticket in Kansas. But he, he cleared it up real quick. He said, no, 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 no. Only parking ticket. I was about to go. I, I had carry him with me. I'm playing. I'm playing. <laughs> so we, 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 we get into these jams and these situations and we're wondering how we're going to get out of them. My favorite story in the Bible, my favorite portion of scripture is in the book of Acts chapter number 16. And it's when Paul and Silas were in prison. I mean, I'm going to give this iPad to my wife, which really doesn't mean nothing. And I remember they were in prison. And they got, they got beat and drugged across the city streets. And in town, they were drugged. And the Bible says that they put them in the inner prison. Not only in the inner prison, but they put them in stocks. Uh, was anybody there that day when Paul and Silas were in prison? Just, just... No, I wasn't there either, but I got the microphone, so I get to tell you how I think happened, amen, that day. This is the EJV version, the evangelist Jose version. And the Bible says that they were in stocks, and they, and they were in inner prison. I, I, don't raise your hand, don't raise your hand, don't raise your hand, don't raise your hand. Maybe you've spent a couple of nights, amen, in, in, in jail. Don't raise your hand. Please don't give yourself away right now. Come on. We've been, we've been redeemed. Listen, we, we were washed by the blood. Come on. <laughs> But maybe you spent a couple of nights in, 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 in the county jail and then maybe in prison. Come on, but these prisons were nothing compared to, I mean, you got three squares. You know, come on, you was able to go outside and play basketball, lift weights. No, they had none of that back then. They were in an inner prison. That means that it was dark down there. And there was animal stuff and human feces everywhere. And, and it was just a nasty place. And, and Paul and Silas were locked up uh, and in this place. And, and, and all of a sudden, uh, Paul begins to look at Saul. And he says, Saul, I feel a praise coming on. And Saul looked over at Paul and he said, Paul, listen, I followed you all of these years and, and look where it's gotten us. But if you say you got a song inside of you, then let's go ahead and worship. And I believe that Saul was Latino. Because you give Latinos some wood and they're going to make a sound. They're going to give a beat. And then, I, and then Paul said, uh, Silas, give me a beat. And Silas turns his hands around and he begins to beat the wood a little bit. Uh, and they begin to sing this song. I, I imagine uh, that they sang that song, Can't Nobody Do Me Like Jesus. Uh, Can't Nobody Do Me Like the Lord. And they begin to sing. Uh, and it sounded real good. Um, they begin to harmonize. Uh, sounded better than Boys to Men. Uh, sounded better than Shy Listen. Uh, sounded better than Garth Brooks. Uh, sounded better than Selena y Los Dinos. Come on now. And man, it sounded real good. Uh, they began to harmonize and they made an aroma into the heavens. Uh, and man, and God began to sit back uh, and Jesus looked down uh, and said, look, dad, uh, they're not complaining about the stripes in their back. Uh, they're not complaining that they are in prison. Uh, they're not complaining that they're locked up. Uh, listen, God, dad, dad, look, look, they're not complaining that their internet got cut off, uh, that they don't have no gas money. They're not complaining that there's not enough food on the table. They're not complaining, uh, man, about their sickness inside of them in the midst of their hurt uh, they're giving you glory God uh, and all of a sudden God big and bad sitting on the throne like he is uh, began to tap his foot uh, to the beat of the song and the book of Isaiah chapter 66 says that the earth uh, is the Lord and then in the floor of the earth is the Lord's footstool and he began to tap his foot uh, to the beat of the song uh, and then and as he began to tap his foot an earthquake uh, came down on the earth uh, that opened up the jail cells uh, and began to set them free Listen to me. Don't tell me there's no power in your praise. Don't tell me there's no power in your worship. Don't tell me that there's something about corporate worship that when we come together and lift up the name of Jesus, your situation will change. Watch this. Watch this. 
Because we're so focused and determined amen, about our past. And we let our past determine what's going to happen in the future. But I come today amen, to declare and decree that your future is promising. I come today amen, to declare and decree come on, that your future is joyous. That your future amen, is marvelous. That God has got a plan for your life. God has got a plan for your marriage. God has got a plan for your backslidden children. Your backslidden spouse. God has got a plan. Come on for that that job. Come on, that you've been praying and believing for. Let me go just a little bit further. God has got a plan on you entrepreneurs. Come on, they're starting thinking about a business. God has got a plan for your life. But you begin to look back at what's happened in your past and say, I'll never amount to that. But I'm here to let you know, amen, because of the blood of Jesus, because of the price of Calvary, because of the redemption of blood, amen, the redemption of a Savior. And he's made access for you that you'll have a good future. been at my church for going on 23 years actually almost 24 years shall I shall I say in in, in March it'll be 24 years that we've been with our church and in our church we do illustrated dramas we do dramas we do this drama entitled Hell Night we've had over 95,000 people give their life to the Lord amen in in the time frame that we've done it what well, about 17 years ago on Easter, we did a drama, and our pastor was doing an altar call for salvation. And he looked over to the front, and there was a young man sitting right over here in the front, and he says, you need to give your life to the Lord. And the young man says, I'm not ready for that, preacher. So he finishes the altar call. He comes over here, finishes the altar call. A lot of people come up to the front, give their lives to the Lord. He felt compelled to go back to this young man. And tell this young man, you really need to give your life to the Lord. And the young man looked at the preacher, and he says, preacher, I'm young. I have my whole life to live. I don't need none of that, what you're talking about right now. Three weeks later to the day, he was riding in the back seat of a car. The driver was going 85 miles per hour racing another car down the same church, the same street where the church sits at where he denied Christ. Watch this. The driver loses control of the vehicle. The car goes airborne, flips midair. He gets ejected out of the back window. He lands 25 feet away from the accident scene with his body facing up and his face facing the ground, died instantly. Watch this. Why do I say that? Why do I say it? Because the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. You're not promised tomorrow. Listen to me. He woke up that morning just like you woke up, not knowing that that day was the last day of his life. Come on. He woke up that morning just like you woke up, not making it right with his family, not making it right with his mom, his dad, not thinking that that was going to be the last day on his earth. Amen. But he just woke up just like you did on this morning. See, that's, that story is very, 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 very sad. Tragedy, and it hits me real close. My I do this altar call everywhere I go because it hits me close to my heart. Why? Because that was my nephew. That was my nephew, and he grew up in the church. My sister got offended and left the church and took her kids with her. And he happened to come back that day because I was in the drama. He wanted to come see his uncle at church. 17 years old, had just went to the prom. Three weeks away from graduation. Three weeks away from graduation. See, my sister got offended and left. And I often think this, Pastor, and I'm not judging this. I don't know, you know, uh, uh, nothing like that, and nor would I. But even though she was offended, if she had made it right, if she had talked to whoever offended her, the leader, the pastor, whoever it was, and made it right, Instead of just leaving. See, because what happens is that we don't realize the decisions that we make impact our family. The decisions that we make uh, impact our children. Listen, and we get offended and we're ready to leave church and we move to another church. Uh, and now we have bags that we carry from the other church and we're wondering why it's not getting no better. Why is it not getting better? Why is my family still messed up? Why is my wife now backslidden? Why is my husband not going to church no more? Why have my children left me? And now we get 
offended again and we moved to another church. And now we're carrying even more baggage. Why? Because the thing is that we allow offense, which is the bait of Satan, to get us. And now we're mad with everybody instead of really saying, did God tell me to leave? People leave churches out of offense and out of the weirdest, smallest things and cover it up with an excuse instead of the realization that you're offended and you need to make it right. I don't know why it went that way, but let me go back to the, let me go back to the, to the first part. The Bible says it is appointed for every man to die once and then the judgment. You're going to have to stand in front of a living God and give an account for your life. And he's not going to ask you, what church did you go to? He's not going to ask you, were you an usher? Were you a pastor? Were you a preacher? No, he's going to ask you one thing. What did you do with my son Jesus? Did you receive him or did you reject him? Hear me out. Hear me out. My last scripture here, we're going to pray. Revelation 21, verse number 8. Revelation 21, verse number 8. You can study this when, I, when you get home. This is a list of people that will not make heaven their home. Listen to me. Revelation 21, 8 gives you a list of people that will not make heaven their home. You know what the very last one on there is? All liars. The Bible says, all liars will find their place, will find their place in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. All liars. Why do I say that? Why do I say that? Why do I say that? Because I'm about to ask you a question. I'm about to ask you a question. That it's really, I, I pray that you be sincere about your response this morning. My question is simply this. If you was to die right now, if all the air in your body left now, would you make heaven your home? Would you spend eternity, watch this, in heaven or in hell? Because you can't have heaven without hell. Hear me out, 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 hear me out. In a, in a, in a church this size, with this, people, with this many people in here, your pride won't allow you to answer that word correctly because you don't want people to know your struggles. And you don't want people to know what you're going through. And you don't want your leader to know, man, I'm messed up. And you try to hide it. Your pride doesn't let you. So I'm going to ask you this question. I want you to think about the question that I'm asking. If you used to die right now, would you make heaven your home? I do this altar call everywhere, Pastor. I do this altar call everywhere. And you know, people get mad at me because I do an altar call like this. They say, why you pressure people? I tell them simply this, you did not get offended or did not get mad when you were pressured to lose your virginity. You didn't get mad when somebody pressured you to get drunk. You didn't get mad when somebody pressured you to skip school and go get loaded. But a man of God pressures you to make a decision that can change the very soul of your eternity, that can change your destiny, and you get offended and you get all mad and bent out of shape, Say, why are you trying to fear? Why are you trying to put fear in people? Well, my Bible tells me don't fear him that can kill the body, but fear him that can kill the body, but they can also send the soul into eternal damnation. That's whom you should fear. So if I could put the fear of God in you, watch this, that can make you make a decision that will change your life forever, then I've done my job. So I'm going to ask you this one more time. Watch this. I'm going to ask you this one more time. If you used to die right now, listen, listen, listen. And you know that you'd make heaven your home. That's good. But maybe you're here and you don't know. Maybe you're here, you're like, man, who, man, you got me thinking right now. I don't know if I'd make heaven your home. I'd love to pray for you. I would love to pray for you. Maybe you're in this place, you've never given your life to the Lord. Maybe you're in this place, man, you backslid. Listen to me. You once walked with God, but now you're far from him. You're far from living according to the word of God. And you're saying, on this Sunday morning, come on, as Pastor said up here, it's Bronco Sunday. Come on now. And then on this Bronco Sunday, uh, I want to give my life to I want to rededicate my life. I just want to make a fresh commitment. If that's you, would you just raise your hand, put it right back down. I'll see it and God will see it. Amen. God bless you. All hands going up everywhere. Hands going up everywhere. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Hands are going up everywhere. Watch this, watch this, because I'm going to do this real quick. And we're going to pray for those that lifted their hands. Watch this, watch this. Because you could be in a place, like I said earlier, you could be in a place like this and hide. And your pride won't let you answer. But you're not promised when you walk out of those doors. You're not promised. Your life is but a vapor. It's here one second and it's gone. 
Just like that. Just like that. Are you ready to stand before God? Are you ready to stand before God and give an account? Because see, listen, you'll never be able to say, I nobody ever told me. You'll never be able to say, I never knew. Because this message that I just keep doing right now is going to be replayed in your mind over and over and over and over. I had a chance and I didn't receive it. So listen, if that's you, you raise your hand. Would you get out of your seat, meet me at this altar? Come on, if that's you, if you, if you raise your hand, come on, would you please get out of your seat, come meet me at this altar. Can we move this pulpit? Can you move this, buddy? Just set it over here somewhere, it's fine. Come on, strong man, come on, yes, look at him. Yes, there you go. Glory, come on, if that's you, you raise your hand, come on, get out of your seat. Come meet me at this altar. I know there's a lot of folk that raise their hand, you're like, man, come on. Come on, you raise your hand. Come meet me at this altar. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Yes, yes, yes. Come on. Come on. This is what it's about. Come on, come on. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to pray. Listen, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to say a prayer. But listen to me. It's not about just a prayer. But it's about a relationship. It's about a relationship with him. So we're just going to repeat this prayer. This prayer is not the only thing. Lifestyles have to be changed. Some of you are going to have to. Listen. Listen. Some of you are going to have to replace your playmates and your playground. Because they keep pulling you back to your yesterday. You got to cut some people loose. They keep putting you back or keep pulling you back. So we're going to say this prayer. Church, this is a family church. I'm going to say a prayer, but I'm going to ask you to repeat it with them. So that way they're not saying it alone. Is that cool? Amen. Come on. So we're going to say this prayer. Say, Jesus. I'm a sinner in search of a savior. I believe that you died and rose again for my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Remove anything and everything that does not belong. I want to live my life according to your word. To do what you've called me to do. And to be who you've called me to be. I receive you now as Lord and Savior. Receive me now as son and daughter. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, somebody give Jesus some praise. The Bible says all heaven rejoices when one sinner repents. Come on. Father God, I pray for every honest heart that is up here today that have given their life to you. I pray, God, that you would surround them around men and women. They would disciple them. They would teach them. God, they would nurture them. They would impart vision into them. And God, they will bring encouragement unto them. We bless you and we bless them for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on. <laughs> Glory. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You guys can go back to your seats real quick. Hallelujah. I'm going to have my wife come up. We're going to minister over some people if I could. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, let me, let me, let me. If you're sick in body, could you just stand to your feet? You're sick in body, could you just stand? I mean, if that's you, you're sick in body, could you just stand to your feet? Come on, real quick. This is what I want you to do. I want you to take your right hand. I want you to take your right hand. You're sick in body. Take your right hand. I want you to place it wherever it is that you're hurting at. Wherever it is. Amen. Wherever it is. We're going to pray. We're going to believe God right now. God is a healer. Come on. So, Father God, we thank you for these honest hearts. God, they have ailments, have illnesses. We declare and decree your word. says that by your stripes we are healed. 
We declare and decree, God, that your word says that you are the God who healeth us, that your very character is that you are a healer. So we stand declared healing right now in the name of Jesus. Pain, you must go now in the name of Jesus. Frustration, you got to go now in the name of Jesus. Disease, you got to go now in the name of Jesus. God, we bless you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, if, if, you, if, you, if you got prayer for that, I need you to check yourself. Come on, just check. If you couldn't bend down, bend down, touch your toes. Come on, if, if, if it was your neck, if it was your wrist, whatever it is, check yourself, amen, right quick. As my husband was ministering, this is what I heard. The Lord is sovereign. He loves us so much. His mind, his thought is always on you. He's always thinking of us. He's always thinking his very best for you. I hear this. I get questioned a lot. I don't feel love. I, wanna, I want you to understand one thing. If you never heard it from one person, Jesus showed it on Calvary. His mind is always stayed upon you. He's thinking of every decision you make. He watches over your family. He's always praying. The Bible said that he prays intercession for you to God the Father. He's always thinking his very best for you when nobody else thinks. That's why I love that scripture in Psalms 122. I was glad when they said unto me to go to the house of the Lord. Because if it's for nobody else, it's for you, Lord. It's for you while I worship. It's you because I sing. It's you because I get up and say that I thank you and I'm grateful. See, gratefulness change your perspective who God is. Because if you understand where you was at and where you are today, you begin to say, I thank you, God, that you didn't leave me where I was at. I thank you, God, that I'm not in my hospital. Listen, there's people in the hospital wish they can be where you at. Trade places with you and just worship one more time. So I want you to get out of a building mentality and say, I am the church. Wherever I go, I bring glory. I am a carrier of glory. The lady that blew the shofar, could, could you come right here? I, I want to pray for you. When you come hungry and thirsty for God, you should drink. You shall eat. People leave church and they say, oh, I don't want to go to that church because I don't get fed. Well, your mouth wasn't open to eat. You don't go to the restaurant, pay your money and say, oh, I just left. I, I, I didn't eat. No, you go pay your money. You go eat. Right. So when I go to the church, I determine whatever my pastor preaching, I'm eating it. Because your pastor preach a good word. I heard the Lord say, as you was blowing the shofar, I'm going to take you to a season of intercession more than ever. The Lord said, I break everything that tries to come in the season over you. He said, you blew into the heavenly realm. You unlock destiny. You unlock. There was things in the atmosphere that what, as you was blowing, that was causing a change. There was people sitting in this place that are going through some listen some deep deep things and the Lord say daughter you open up the windows of heaven that it begins to flow the supernatural on the earth the Lord say daughter continue to press press through press through because you're going to begin to see your victory he said your victory is in front of you he said look up where your help comes from the Lord said this is a season of breakthrough this is a season of revelation I don't know you're, you're, you're one that believed the incredible you believe things uh, in the supernatural and the Lord said I'm going to open Open your eyes and unveil the secrets and mysteries of the heavenly realm. He said, daughter, get ready. You're going to see, you're going to see, you're going to see, you're going to hear the sounds of heaven. Can I tell you the heavens are always open. Listen to me. The heaven doesn't close. We don't live under a closed heaven. We live under an open heaven. That's why the Bible said glory goes from glory. Glory goes from glory. Because there's an open heaven. God wants to release his power upon you and the earth. Young lady, I hear the Lord say little children are going to sit under you. 
and you're going to begin to minister to them. He said, you're going to minister the word of the Lord to them that will cause change. There will be children that comes to this place that are broken. Their parents would drop them off and they would not come into this church, but they will come because there's something going on that is alive. And the Lord said, daughter, you will bring a message to them that will cause change to their family. You will cause change to the mother and the father. The Lord said, get ready in this next season. I'm about to shift some things inside of your heart in your life. They're going to be such a passion for children. It's going to be upon you. And the Lord said, teach them the ways of me. That when they do grow older, they will not depart from the faith. He said, teach them. I just keep hearing the Lord say, so I'm going to open up another area that's going to be where you're going to be able to sit with children and do like Bible classes or, or, or like Bible schools, some kind of deal with them. I don't know if you guys do vocational Bible studies or anything like that, but I see the Lord orchestrating Bible study for little children. It's because the children... It's the one is the next generation. There's generation after generation. Unless they talk, how would they know? And I hear the Lord say, I'm going to use you. I don't know if you guys understand. The Lord have opened a door up for you to come to this building. I see the Lord. It, it, this place is going to be so packed out that you're not going to fit here. I hear the Lord say, I'm going to cause a greater move for you because this place is just a stepping ground to where you're about to go. The Lord said, this is not your destination, but there should be another place. He said, compel them to come to me. Begin to preach and teach them to come to me because that's where who I am and where I will be. I see the Lord is causing expansion to you. This place too small, and I know you just moved in. And because God has the greater for you. This last season have been a little rough, Pastor Mike, for this church. The ups and the downs. But the Lord said, I'm going to cause a stability upon the house. I'm going to cause a stability upon the house. And we're going to cause some structure that's going to be set in place and in motion. The Lord said, there will be a momentum that will continue to go a flow of my spirit in this place. He said, get ready and get ready for the momentum of my spirit to flow through this place and out of this place. It's not to be contained in here, but to go out of this place. He said, my word, it comes in and it flows out like a river. He said, get ready. I'm going to begin to build up men and women to go out and speak the good news and compel them to come to my house. The Lord said, get ready. Do not be stagnant in this season, but he said, be steadfast in your word and in your worship. He said, be steadfast in your word and in your worship because they will come. The problem with people coming inside of the church, coming and leaving, is that we don't know how to gather them and cause them to look unto him. They're not looking to us. They're looking for him. And so God wants to cause our own momentum in this place of his spirit to come through and out there. And so I see great things coming your way, Pastor Matt. I see good things coming. Hallelujah. This young lady right here in the red hair, could you just stand Jesus. right here? The, the season of frustration, despair in this last season, it's getting ready to Go. God is getting ready to blow that away. You've been in a season where depression has even tried to come upon you, where anxiety and it feels like something is pushing down on your chest and, and even restless nights when you don't sleep at night. Your mind is running 100 miles an hour. You're wondering, wow, man, what in the world has happened? I hear the Spirit of the Lord say this. I'm getting ready to move that away from you. There's some hurt uh, that has come upon you yeah. this last season, but God says, uh, I'm getting ready to heal your heart. Uh, for this is going to be the season that you're going to pick up and run. This is the season where you're going to get closer to the anointing, and God says, I'm getting and ready to break every stronghold and every Thing that has come against even your mind. Uh, there's a renewing in your mind even on right now as I'm speaking to you. God says, I'm getting ready to blow away some things that have tried to bring despair and try to close off. There's some things that you've dreamed about. There's things that you've wanted to do, but has stopped. Dreams when you was a little girl to do this and do that have come and gone, but God says, I'm getting ready to bring that back yeah. into your spirit once again. I'm getting ready to bring that back into your dream. I hear the Spirit of the Lord say this, dream again, because I'm getting ready to elevate you to the place that you have 
prayed and you have sought God for since you was a child, just lift your hands right where you're at, would you? Just lift your hands. Father God, breathe on her. Holy Spirit, fall fresh upon her right now in the name of, I rebuke every adversary. I rebuke every mind battle. I rebuke uh, every thought uh, that is trying, I even rebuke that that tries to sit on her in the midnight hour. I rebuke, I rebuke it and I loose her right now in the name of, you got to let her go now in Jesus name I speak freedom now in the name of Jesus taking a deep breath sweetie taking a deep breath uh, come on there's something falling off of you even right now come on taking a deep breath Ramako Tobo say ah in the name of Jesus uh, fall fresh upon her Holy Spirit uh, in Jesus name glory come on somebody give Jesus some praise